everyone. We are just um, turning on live stream. Okay, so I'd like to call the Committee of the Whole of Tuesday, May 16th, 2023 to order. And I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation and take some time to reflect on how much we appreciate um, the lands and waters here that have been stewarded by the Comox First Nation since time immemorial. And we have reports. So before that, I'll just have some op opening remarks here. I wanna welcome everyone and thank you very much for joining us for the elected officials forum. Attending today are representatives of the Comox Valley Regional District, the town of Comox, city of Courtney, village of Cumberland, the Comox Valley Schools, the Islands Trust and Ships Point Improvement District. Um, Comox First Nation was invited, but we don't have any attendees today. Participants are joining the meeting, uh, both in person, as you can all see, and online. Elected officials forums are organized a few times a year by the RD to bring together the various public bodies and authorities to learn about a topic, share information, and engage in dialogue. Today's forum is focused on capital infrastructure. As local elected officials, we, are all, we all understand the importance of community infrastructure. In many ways, it's the literal and figurative foundation of many services such as water supply, sewerage, roads, community, education, culture, recreation, and others. The quality of life and economic success of our community is heavily influenced by the quality of this infrastructure. Capital projects represent major investments to construction, refurbish, and maintain these assets to meet the evolving needs of our communities, ensure capacity for growing populations, and adapt to our changing environment. There are two parts to today's session. The first is a presentation on the recent work completed by the Comox Valley Recreation Commission to identify its vision, vision and plans for investment in a regional recreation infra, regional infrastructure. And the second part of the forum provides a snapshot of each of the local jurisdictions, current and upcoming key capital um, projects. To lead off, the first presentation, I'm pleased to invite Director Melanie McCollum, Chair of the Recreation Commission, to provide some opening remarks on the process and outcomes of their recent work to define the path forward for infrastructure investment. Thanks, Jesse. Um, yeah, the Comox Valley Recreation Commission completed our strategic planning after two working sessions. Uh, on February 21st of this year, um, we are provided an opportunity to set the Commission's strategic plan by revisiting the priorities of asset management, partnerships, connectivity, accessibility, and volunteer engagement to determine if these remained the right priorities for the next four years. And then on March 2nd of 2023, a capital development workshop was held to determine Commission priorities and set a framework to achieve to uh, achieve the objectives. Commission members were provided with a capital development book outlining various options based on relevant study work. The book also included financing approaches with the ability for the commission to begin to initiate priorities in 2023. The strategic planning process for the commission provided a focus on decision-making for future development Numerous plans for various facilities support the process. The plans result from potential new facilities and the need to better understand existing user rates, infrastructure conditions, and opportunities that align with corporate strategic plans. Highlights from the plan envisioned additional winter field artificial turf capacity, as well as amenity upgrades to existing fields the need for additional ice surfaces, the benefits of delivering aquatic services from a central location, a borrowing strategy to outline potential funding op options, 
This process helps support amendments to the financial plan in 2022 to facilitate immediate actions and also be the, and also be the basis for longer term financial planning beginning in the 2024 to 2028 budget. With this, I'll pass it over to Jennifer Zabitten, manager of rec services, who will walk you through the outcomes of both the planning sessions. Thanks. Thank you. Through the chair. So as um, as was just announced, your staff are here today to provide all with a quick update on our rec commission strategic plans for goals, visions, and capital infrastructure. But before uh, staff begin, we would like to provide two very big uh, thank yous. So the first thank yous to our neighboring municipalities and the school district for partnering with and working towards the completion of the various recreational studies, and in particular, the pool and aquatic studies. And the second big thank you is to our Rec Commission for allowing staff to participate in the strategic planning. It was a very good interaction, and without your support, we wouldn't be here today having this conversation. So thank you. So first up on the February session, there was the goals and the vision. With a little bit of fine tuning, we've landed with a why, what, and a how. So the why is, so why, why is recreation here? What are we doing? We are here to support the physical, mental, and social and emotional community and individual wellness throughout the Comox Valley Regional District. The what, to build and maintain excellent and sustainable sport and rec facilities that balance location with financial responsibility, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and address climate change. The other what is, the delivery of a wide variety of innovative and responsive sport and recreation programs and services that meet community needs, promote structured and unstructured activities. The how, ensure that recreation programs and services and facilities are accessible and reduce barriers to participate and are welcoming and culturally appropriate, promote lifelong sport and recreation, are inclusive and encourage a sense of belonging, and create and support partnerships with municipalities, school district, Comox First Nations and community organizations to deliver sport and rec programs and services that increase volunteerism and make the best of public and community facilities and resources. So the, these strategic goals and visions become part of the staff's work plan. So now we're going to move forward into the capital, uh, the capital piece. And we'll start with a very important topic, and that's the climate crisis, environmental stewardship and production, Product, production, sorry. Um, I think many are aware that rec facilities account for 54% of the CVRD's total GHG emissions, which presents an opportunity to consider the existing environmental footprint, as well as future expansion of facilities to meet the community priorities, and in specific, the ice arena. It's a very big greenhouse gas generator. Um, the reduction of greenhouse gas footprints through the consolidation of the sports center and the aquatic facilities, the closure of an aging aquatic facilities at the sports center, and the focus on one facility that can be upgraded and improved over time is already a big step towards the reduction of greenhouse gases. Other ways that we can do this and that we are gonna be able to accomplish this is renovating or adding to an existing building has that potential to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions at the operational level. So at the end of the day, overall opportunities exist for the CBRD to increase energy efficiency and conservation through the design and construction of new buildings and the profound renovation of existing buildings. In addition, the CVRD is currently working with partners on ways to reduce current and future GHG emissions at the Aquatic Center with preliminary studies results to identify the hospital's heating and cooling operational profiles as a potential energy recovery source. So as we move through this presentation and we talk about the, in particularly the indoor facilities, we're mindful that there are studies that are going to need to happen in respects to greenhouse gases before taking those next steps for, uh, forwards. So starting with the first, um, the first preferred um, project is the sports field uh, strategy. So sports field study work commenced in June of 2022, which included research and engagement with 11 user groups and 486 residents through public field use surveys. A state of the field's condition assessment was completed through the summer and the fall. And the final report included recommendations for A, the location of a second artificial turf field as per direction from the Rec Commission in November of 2021. There were three suitable locations, Billmore Park, Highland Park, and GP Vanier, with the preferred location being Vanier. School District 71 is aware of the benefits of locating a second artificial turf at Vanier and will be voting on a decision at their public meeting on May 30th. 
B. The report also recommended amenity contributions to upgrade to existing fields, such as lighting, washrooms, and condition of the fields. And C, a user group allocations policy, which is something that staff will be working together in a partnership with the City of Courtney on. Next up, we, we have the topic of ICE. Uh, the 2017 Comox Valley Regional District Indoor Rec Facilities Master Plan included an addition of a leisure ice pad and a new full-size ice arena for consideration. In 2019, the Commission identified a long-term plan for recreation infrastructure and sustainable delivery of these services as a strategic priority for the CVRD Rec Department. In 2022, the CVRD undertook a two-phase engagement process with the general public and with current user groups. The results of the survey led to some changes and additions to public programs, including an expanded hockey, uh, Comox Valley Hockey League, a trial senior skate, and a trial late night drop-in hockey program, and a new registered para hockey skill development program for youth. As we realized we're getting busier and busier, we had to recircle back to the ICE, the, the conversation of ICE, and the preferred option, which is the one that's up on the screen, which is um, an additional uh, sheet of ICE beside Arena 2. The, sorry, the black is the parking lot. We couldn't get a gray lot, so you have a black parking lot. Um, this preferred option incorporates the additional function of a full-size shrink surface that will be added to the sports center around the back, attaching to the side of the arena, Parking would need to be reconfigured, so that involves a study of some sort. And the idea of a larger arena with seating capacity of 1,500 seats has also emerged during this conversation. And this too would require a study and a business case. And into the water, the Comox Valley Aquatic Strategy. The Comox Valley Aquatic Strategy was developed in 2022 in response to earlier facility condition assessments which concluded that both the CVRD Sports Center Pool and the City of Courtney and District Memorial Outdoor Pool are nearing the end of their expected lifespans. The study took into account the Courtney and District Memorial Outdoor Pool, which was built in 1940, the Comox Valley Sports Center, which was constructed in 1973, and the Comox Valley Aquatic Center built in 1998. The 19-wing pool, uh, while partnerships with this facility exist and the number of swims included in the data analysis, this facility is governed, uh, is part of the Government of Canada infrastructure and outside the scope of the study. So how we involve the, um, the 19 wing pool is through partnerships. The study included the review of planning documents, including pertinent official community plans, master plans and facility assessment reports, evaluating our services based on analysis of aquatic services in other jurisdictions, trends and leading practices for aquatic services, delivery and programming, supply and demand assessment aquatics, and community engagement. Through that process, the preferred option for our rec commission incorporates the amenities and the programming um, of the sports center pool into the current aquatic center site. So you can see up on the, on the screen, um, there is an, an addition um, on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, with a distinct focus on the provision of wellness with the addition of a 25 meter pool. So this schematic hasn't actually been updated um, to show a potential additional 25 meter pool. It assumes that it assumes the closure of the aquatic facilities at the sports center um, with a 25 meter extension or a 25 meter attachment. It assumes um, that sports center would be repurposed uh, the building into another recreational activity. The aquatic study also reviews the future of the outdoor pool, and one option to be considered is the relocation to the aquatic center of the outdoor pool. This option could be considered if the city of Courtney was to request or pursue this as an option for the outdoor pool. Next up, we have a little bit of a chart for the financial factors, and this just breaks out what it would look like um, putting in the sports field, the full sheet of uh, ice, um, and, then the, and then the additional indoor of the aquatic center. Um, so on the bottom line is probably the biggest, uh, the, the biggest piece of information you'd like to know, which is the cumulative impact per household, which is $32 in the year 2024. And it carries on until 2026, where it goes up to $61, because you're now including um, another facility and then 61, 61, and 71. And understanding that this is in today's dollars, when we get to the point of these potential projects, we don't know at this point what the, what the cost is gonna be. 
Um, the results from the capital development workshop indicate desired short and medium and longer term projects as within this chart. So you can see the sports field expansion is a short term. The ice arena is a short and heading towards medium. And then the aquatic center, or the, the additional water space heads into the medium. Each capital project will move through stages of assessment, community consultation, programming, design, and build. So there's still many steps that need to happen for each one. It will take multiple years to complete each project, depending on the magnitude and the scope. Projects have been staggered across seven years to gradually smooth out the increased need for financial resources. The capital costs have been provided by CBRD consultants and projected again in today's dollars. Project funding is assumed to be 100% debt. Additional operating costs are projected as described within the final financial forecast and capital plan options document, which the, the Comox Valley Rec Commission was working out of when we did these sessions. Um, and the commission has indicated a desire to expand upon the scope of both the ice rink and the indoor pool expansion. And should this occur, capital costs and property tax implications per household um, will increase. The commission's desire to move forward with an enhancement to current fields is not reflected within the table above. Um, and moving out beyond 2040, the commission has indicated a desire to further investigate the hub concept at Vanier to include the future potential fields, rinks, and aquatic uh, services. And on to our uh, last slide, a little bit on the timelines and the next steps. So in closing the proposed timelines, um, the sports field expansion within the next two to four years with work starting here fairly immediately and the ice expansion would fall into that two to four year expansion. The medium term, which is five to seven years is the aquatics expansion. And currently the preferred option is that 2A where we expand out the side of the aquatic center. Where we, where we are and where we would like to go is we've informed the user groups following the March 21st, 2023 commission meeting. In June, we have open houses for community engagement to be scheduled um, for in the second to last week of June to walk them through the Rec Commission strategic plan um, and then begin with the short-term uh, work fairly immediately of the geotechnical and feasibility studies for the GP Vanier School for the addition of a, for an additional artificial turf field and to identify capital and operating costs along with life cycle and asset management considerations. Then the next steps will be the results of the June 2023 open house will be shared with the Rec Commission in the fall, following which will be the commencement of the ice surface and energy analysis. So again, the energy analysis needs to come very early on in the discussions. And then report back to the Commission on the potential corporate and energy emissions plan and objectives for the Rec facilities. And then when that's all done, we'll do it all over again for the pool analysis. And we anticipate starting that in 2025. And of note, the timing of this framework for the pool has, has the added benefit to provide the City of Courtney Council the time to make decisions surrounding the outdoor pool. And again, uh, lastly, uh, the long-term facility planning, understanding the limitations and opportunities of the Vanier site to continue to expand as a major recreational hub for the area and additionally explore potential expansion options to, to support aquatics in the long term at the existing aquatic center site. So there's a lot of things going on. It's, a, it's a, an, exciting, um, an exciting strategic plan and staff are really looking forward to moving through the steps one by one and reporting back to the Rec Commission. So on that note, that's the end of the presentation and staff are happy to take um, questions. Great, thanks so much, Jennifer. So I'll open it up to any of the elected officials or staff um, if they have questions for Jennifer on any of the projects presented. I'm looking online as well. I don't see any hands. Um, okay, Mayor Brown, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks so much <laughs> for the presentation. Um, I'm just curious about uh, user numbers. I'm sure that was part of the process, but we uh, I don't have that information. Through the chair, yes. Uh, user numbers for, for each one of the uh, various studies was completed. And um, the studies are on the project page at the CVRD and staff can provide those numbers um, forward. Sorry, go ahead. 
Um, and is there uh, usage? So are there um, stats on how regularly the usage is, is occurring, whether there's gaps in usage and all of that? Is that included in that information as well? Through the chair, it's um, it's fairly in depth, maybe not maybe not diving in quite as deep as as just uh, as just asked, but definitely um, on the use and on on the slow periods. Um, in, in specific with the pools, it's it's broken out quite clearly. Um, for the um, field study, it's it's really more about the amount of use that's out there, and there's a lot of use. Um, something's a little bit easier. There's not very much downtime out there for sure. Um, yeah, I, I imagine the downtimes in the pool and the um, ice rinks, which is, I guess, what I'm trying to get at, just what that downtime is. Through the chair staff, will ensure to provide that information. And next we have Dr. Grieve. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and no, I'm not going to mention the exhibition ground and the multiplex. But what I will mention is the fact that uh, when we built the aquatic center, it was originally going to be a 50 meter Olympic pool. So it's sort of akin to doing a 100 yard dash or 100 meter dash and doing 50 meters, turning around, running back the other way. So I'm just wondering what's changed on the plan because i thought that made the short list the concept of maybe taking the pool that's there right now and extending it so you have a proper olympic sized pool for our, our young uh, swimmers to train on through the chair that's the uh, the intention is to investigate having the 50 meters so 25 and 25 but in the event of the location of the pool it'll be dependent on the distance behind the pool towards Rhine road and the distance out into the parking lot. So that's the next steps to be investigated when it comes to the pool is, is how to, to the, the preferred option would be to go 50 meters versus the 25 and 25. Um, swim up one end, get out and swim. <laughs> yeah. And NIC is becoming prime real estate right now. So <laughs> no, I think it would be, it would be foolish to build another small pool. Uh, just saying, because, you know, we're, we're building for the future and, and uh, we have had some really good swimmers come out of this valley. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Arbor. Yeah, thanks for the presentation, Jennifer, and the introduction, uh, Chair McCollum. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, like from slide two, which was really emphasizing um, trying to build some climate objectives into our rec service, as you said, recognizing that it produces 54% of our GHG emission. Um, and there was no capital plan presented around the, the retrofits that are being considered because there's, and then, and then after that, there's definitely numbered, um, projects, new projects. So I'm just wondering, uh, how would adding these new projects impact our GHG emissions? And second, what will be the cost to do deep retrofits? There's been amazing projects across Canada around deep retrofits, but they're not necessarily cheap and they, they do require leverage with provincial and, and federal government. So I'm just trying, I don't see in the five-year plan any kind of retrofits. I just see new projects that are more likely to add GHG emissions. Through the chair, in the current five-year plan, there is an energy um, emissions study that will be completed for both the sports center and the aquatic center, the full head-to-toe study. And then there's also a study for the reduction of the carbon footprints. And um, they've just been put into this five-year plan that we currently have. And um, as we walk through those studies, some of the things that staff are doing are flipping out the air handling units, motors, fans, all those things to help with, with um, you know, with the GHG. Um, staff are, the facilities are almost at the point where almost everything's been flipped out and changed to for a reduction of greenhouse gases outside of moving forward with the capital projects. We've come a lot, they've, the facilities have come a long way with a lot of changes. Um, just following that, so um, are we looking at um, and any improvements to the envelopes of the buildings? Uh, I think in all of the plans, we're keeping all of the facilities that we have now. Um, so is there, or have you not looked at that? Are we waiting for the for the study to, to look at that? Through the chair, the, the envelopes themselves, um, uh, haven't really been assessed. So that will be part of this next uh, energy and emissions assessment. Uh, the roofs have been assessed and there is some work that's going to be completed on, on, 
on the roofs of both facilities over the next five and eight years to, to provide that improvement because heat does like to go up and out. That's a big one. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, Director Hillian, go ahead. Oh, try again, there you go. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for the report, Jennifer. Um, two points. Uh, first of all, um, you did mention the possibility remains of uh, moving the outdoor pool up to the aquatic center, but I think it's worth uh, stating that that, um, that was not favored by a lot of people um, as an option um, in terms of the suitability of that location. Um, so more work to do on that for sure. Uh, the second point, um, I, I appreciate that the aquatic study is a longer term project, but I'm wondering uh, what the chances are that uh, we can move more quickly on the conversion of the existing sports center pool into an indoor facility, which I think there's a there's a huge appetite in the valley uh, to uh, move towards that uh, uh, option. Through the chair. <laughs> Uh, staff, staff, I think, continue to uh, to review and analyze and take a look and see what the timing is of, of closing one facility and repurposing it. Um, and I believe that will be an internal conversation that we need to be carried on through the within the organization um, before providing a response. Fair enough. Thanks. Maybe I would just add that um, the work plan that, that is in front of the Recreation Commission and, and staff right now is is fairly ambitious with the with the field uh, artificial turf and the uh, and the ice review and analysis, and so just being mindful of of not taking on more than what we can what we can deliver on, and and the commission was pretty clear, I think, on the aquatics being in that longer time frame consideration. Thank you. So not to put anybody on the spot, but I think we were hoping to hear a bit from the school district, um, being that some of the plans uh, are on your lands and uh, and also um, maybe reflect on um, your own greenhouse gas um, goals and how we might um, how, how we might cooperate on on reaching those goals. Thanks, Ian. Okay. You good? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Chair Kettler. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Ian Hesselgrave, Director of Operations for the School District, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm not going to present any slides, I'm just going to talk. And we have um, what I wanted to do was focus in on our capital objectives broadly and talk about some things where we're, we're collaborating and I think some opportunities where we overlap. So I think in the, just, a, I'd like to put a little context in it first, is that in the last five years, the school district has spent about $100 million on capital projects, and that's since 2018. We've done a major seismic upgrade and renovation of GP Vanney Secondary School. It's completely changed. Uh, we've also built a new Lake Trail Community School. I built a new school on Hornby Island, and we've done a number of minor projects. And when we say minor, it's probably 5 million and under. And I think it's a symptom of where we are in the Comox Valley and how we're growing as a community because the school district is a really good reflection of that. So our capital plan, we submit on an annual basis with a five-year outlook to the Ministry of Education and Child Care. And I think uh, that name change from Ministry of Education, Ministry of Education and Child Care is a key factor for us. So we, we really look at three pieces to our capital plan. Number one for us is space needs. And I'll talk through that for a moment. Number two is childcare. And number three is greenhouse gas reduction, energy efficiency, and climate change. So when we look at uh, space needs, I think for context, in 2016, 2014-15 uh, was probably the bottom for school numbers for us over the a 15 year run. We had um, seen declining enrollment for quite a few years, probably since about year 2000. And as we rolled into the 15, 16 school year, had more than 100 classrooms available, which equates to probably 2,500 students. Anywhere between 2,500 and 3,000 students could be easily absorbed into our system. Right now, I think I have that many 
So we're probably less than 10 classrooms available. Plus we have 50 modular classrooms on school sites because there isn't a normal distribution. So we're really challenged. So if we think about that in the last six or seven years, we have grown up over 10,000 students. It's the largest we've ever been. And really there's no end in sight because our planning timeline is about is 10 years. That's the horizon. Anywhere beyond five years is really, really difficult to, to forecast student numbers. We push to 10. And in all of that period, we're looking at growth. So our capital plan, number one, is to address those space needs. And then when we look at the school district in, a, in the big picture, we have two areas that are exceptionally challenging for us. And that's the south end of the district, Royston and Cumberland. And the second area is what we call the Courtney Comox corridor. So as we go from Valley View School and through to Aspen, Rob Road, Brooklyn, and Airport in a, in a nice curving U. So on the south end of the district, we have done everything we can to shift the deck chairs. So we've adjusted the boundaries and moved things around as much as we can. The board made some very difficult decisions around that. But now we're simply um, we're simply dealing with the kids that we have in that end. So Royston Elementary is about 50% over capacity. So it, it's a it's a nice little school for 205 kids, and it sits around 300. It was worse, and fortunately, the board did approve the boundary change. And then Cumberland School, which is has a capacity of 545, is going to be about 700. So. And that is with really no end in sight to that as well with the growth in that community. So we have numerous portables or modular classrooms in Cumberland. And we have five modular classrooms in Royston. And it's an area we need to address. So for three years, we've been seeking expansion in there. And we have the exceptionally good news that our preliminary work has been approved to proceed to business case, which really is about getting down to what are the solutions for this so that we can get an approval for funding out of the ministry. And within that uh, size and scope, our TBA, because we are looking at a number of different options, but it is a, it's a large expansion to that school community that we're very excited and will serve the school community for many years. We'll have our business case in with three options by the end of June, and we hope to uh, receive approval from the ministry at some point in this year so we can be in construction. So that's number one, is we need to deal with that end of the district. And so having a significant expansion to, the, to that school site um, will allow us to go there. So a lot of work done in the background and we think we're getting to that place where we're moving. The second thing we're doing is we're actually creating some new administrative space for the school district. So the school district purchased the BC Assessment Center building that's across from Valley View Elementary. That construction started this week on converting that into new administration spaces. And what that does is it allows us to move classrooms that are essentially filling a non-instructional role out of those spaces. So we're, we're doing what needs to be done to create every last classroom. Five classrooms at this stage really, really matters. Before, when we had lots of room, we could afford to move things out of the economy and into our schools. And now we have to go the other way. So this is another key piece is creating some admin space. The building that's right behind me here will still be really well used. We have our uh, inclusive education department, our indigenous education department, it all requires more space and we need uh, a footprint on this side as well. And then our third goal out of the classroom space is to address that Comox Courtney bound, um, Whole corridor. And, you know, we have received the very good news um, from the town of Comox recently that they're looking at a, uh, a multifamily development uh, that would be 700, you know, in and around Aspen Park Elementary, which was news to us. That can, that will always turn into an awful lot of families. It's wonderful. You know, we need space or we need, we need affordable housing and places to live. But those kids have to go to school. So we need, we are going to need room there. And we're seeking right now clarity on our best expansion choices. And by the end of June, we'll be submitting again some more information to the ministry to get cracking on expanding some of the Comox schools. So that's that's our number one priority is we need a place for every student to learn. And number two for us is childcare. So we've been hitting this one really hard 
it's a, a clearly defined community need, and we've done a lot of work. We built a child care facility on Denman Island, on the Denman Island Community School site. It's a beautiful building. It's in fully in operation. Lake Trail, uh, I think you've probably seen it as you've gone by. We have a beautiful little child care center that's working there. And it's really focused on that um, infant toddler age group, and they are full and have a wait list. Uh, we have a child care center in Cumberland that's a month away from being completed, and it's for 75. It's right on the school site, and the school district took over construction of that about a year ago. Great partnership with the village of Cumberland to make this happen. We have a uh, child care center at Glacier View School, child care center at Arden Elementary School that are just about to crack the ground on. And these again are for 75. We're getting a working model. We're figuring it out. Uh, we have a sort of a set design we're using now. And when you start putting in facilities that will serve 75 kids is substantial. And that, um, and we're, we're working with our ministry partners to, uh, to find solutions around how we can fund these as well. The tough part, as we all know, is the staff. Right, and I think every single organization in here has a really difficult time ensuring they have enough people that can work. Um, we at the school district have 1,800 employees. It's the largest employer in, in the Comox Valley. And we have many employees that cannot work full-time simply because of childcare concerns. So, you know, these are self-serving for our own organization and broadly serving for the community as well. And we're gonna keep pushing these out as long as we can get support and funding and they're being operated by not-for-profit community partners, which is excellent. We're just closing. I have RFP closing tomorrow at three o'clock for the operators for Glacier View and Arden. We get them in right at the start of the construction process so they can help. So that, that's, that's number two. Um, and we'll be looking at other locations as soon as we get these other ones rolling. Because we, again, internally only have the capacity to manage so many capital projects at one time. And our third part that we talked about was greenhouse gas reductions and energy efficiency. So like all public sector organizations, we have to do a climate change accountability report. We have to track every um, the little bit of greenhouse gases that we produce, and then we have to achieve carbon neutrality. That's purchased. So it's not really a, uh, it's, I consider it, it's slightly false because we have to, we have to purchase offsets, carbon offsets. But we're um, to meet the the provincial targets, um, those reduction targets, which are very, um, I think they're very forward thinking and progressive. And and we have um, since record keeping has been going on since 2010. We've grown our district footprint and our greenhouse gases have reduced by 16 percent. We're at the tail end of a full boiler replacement program. It's been going on for eight years where we've gone from frankly, uh, dinosaur boilers to uh, very high efficiency ones, they're still um, problematic in the way that, they're, uh, that we're burning hydrocarbons to heat our schools where we would rather electrify. It's a money issue though for us. So we needed to get this first step done to get us into a good place. And then now we're, we're deeply in the transition to electrifying. So at uh, this Last summer, we did uh, we we powered the electric boilers at Glacier View. We put in new controls. We did LED lighting throughout the school, and and this summer the photovoltaic array is going on the roof to provide um, electrical generation for that school. At Demon Island School this summer, we're switching the controls out for the electrics and putting in LED lighting. And then the summer of twenty four, we're putting a PV array there. Hopefully in the summer of 24, we'll convert our first full natural gas school over to an electric school. Um, we're doing a complete mechanical inventory of all schools with an electrification plan. But for context, it's huge dollars. So if we want to take a school like GP Vanier and convert that from natural gas to electricity, we're talking about 2.5 million. So it's a, it's a really big bill. And who's going to put that bill? We can apply for those funds from the ministry, but whether we get those or not is a big deal. So as we dive deeply into this and we look really hard at our greenhouse gas consumption, we're always measuring off what are our largest consumers, what are our um, poor performers, and what are our problem systems. And we, we do a matrix and try to create a Venn diagram where they intersect so that we select the correct billings to upgrade first. 
And we have a lot of data and we've been working very hard on the plan. So we're making steps and we're getting there. We've inventoried every light in the district and we're a third of the way through all our LED upgrades. And we've done all the, the big hitters like schools and band rooms and, and shops where they really need good lighting. But again, it's funding and time. So we're working on all those pieces of the puzzle. And um, included within that is we have a pretty substantial maintenance department. We're kind of self-sufficient. And so we have 50 vehicles, um, everything from light to medium to some heavy duty. And I'm working with an engineering firm in Vancouver called GHD, where we're doing a fleet decarbonization plan. So we're beginning our transition and it's, it's taking a deep dive and looking at culture and what are we doing in terms of how we operate vehicles, how can they change and what can we use instead? So we have our first electric trades van arriving. We've downsized a bunch of vehicles and this company is gonna help us with costing and what we should most logically switch out. So we have a lot of work underway, but as a public sector organization, you know, we only have so many avenues to fund um, for ourselves and we're really reliant upon the ministry and others. I know I've sought grants from places like Hydro and, and other folks to get studies done, but there's some big dollars too out there. It's in our working plan as well to electrify our school bus fleet and that, um, you know, there's grants for that to happen too. It has to be the right route, has to be the right place. It might not work um, if you're running all the way, you know, from Fanny Bay or if we're on the islands, because there's an infrastructure question, but we're going to begin that transition as well. It's going to be a long process. And I think for us where we really, uh, I think we can overlap effectively is, is how can we partner on um, understanding what our, our, our joint needs are and and how can we satisfy those, whether we're working together, you know, we've done lots of work over the years collaboratively on, on whether it's maintaining spaces so we don't have dueling lawnmowers going, you know, that belong to two different municipalities in the same space. And certainly awareness for us of what's coming because our, our growth um, is really, it really gets pressed by where new development is. And we've in fact started doing some assessment of our students based on uh, housing-based models because much of that has changed. There's so much, um, you know, there's the shift away from single family homes are the only place where our families live, you know, and that's just not the facts anymore. So that is, uh, I think in a nutshell, where we're going from a capital perspective, um, but we're really working hard to create space. That's our biggest issue right now because we have none. Awesome. That was a lot of really good information. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I put you on the spot. Um, yeah, but that really does paint a picture. Like, I, I don't think that this board um, had, you know, as, as good an idea of what was going on and to know how busy you are, um, especially with all um, the new childcare spaces and stuff. That's, that's really wonderful to hear. Not that you're um, overworked, but yeah. that we are getting these very important childcare spaces. Um, and I think there are a number of places that we, we can collaborate. Um, you know, one of the things you mentioned, the electric buses, well, we're also looking at um, electrifying our fleet. So a, a charging station, a, a mutual charging station might, might work. We don't know. It's something that we could talk about. Um, you know, obviously we also wanted to um, explore the, um, the heat exchange uh, with Vanier, but, you know, if that retrofit is, you know, too, too capital intensive and there's no funding, then maybe that doesn't make sense, but, but certainly something that I think this board would like to explore further. And, um, you know, just to hear from the school district, um, from an elected, um, you know, from a municipal uh, point of view, uh, we're always thinking about, you know, densifying and, you know, making space for more it's kind of an afterthought about how it's going to fill up the schools and what will be needed um, on the other side of that. So it's it's uh, it's good to hear um, from the school district's perspective. Thanks so much. So we do have some questions, um, starting with Director Grieve. Go ahead. Thanks very much, Madam Chair. And uh, it's certainly uh, great to have somebody here from that Board of Education because uh, too often we operate in totally different silos 
and we're dealing with a lot of the same issues. But traditionally, there's been very little, you know, cross pollination between the groups. So uh, we have you in our sites. You're sitting right over there. So I'm going to ask some questions. Um, first of all, um, maybe uh, speak around uh, around the 300 daycare and after school spaces we're supposed to be needing in the next five years. Um, as you say, you know, we talk about uh, people having challenges at work. Um, I think the, the saying is someone you depend on depends on childcare. So in my area, uh, 9,400 uh, people in area C, uh, mostly in the north, um, we have, um, you know, uh, Miracle Beach Elementary. And uh, we've got um, a lot of young families moving in, contrary to what people think, uh, like the, the old, the older farmers are, uh, can't drive at night anymore. And, uh, you know, they bought their property for 20, 20 grand back in 1969 when they retired the old psychedelic school bus. And now they moved to town and the younger people are coming in. Um, I think uh, NIC graduates around 30 to 35 ECEs a year. 3,000 daycare spaces. It's going to take uh, 100 years to get there. Um, I just want to know uh, what you think about um, uh, what you think the future is holding for the North area in that um, we've got knives, but, you know, I don't really know how knives ties in with 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 the school district, because uh, to my knowledge, they don't have a, a an ECE program there at all. There's no. So I'm just thinking, I mean, wh where can the kids go? Say, say they're go say they're going to to Huban or something. I mean, uh, parents can drive down there and pick them up. But I'm just wondering, what, do you know anything about what the long term plan is for supplying after after school daycare and daycare? And then right now we got the the pumpkin patch uh, 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 preschool at Black Creek, and that's just about it. Sure, I can answer that. So we have uh, there's 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 two parts to that. So number one is projections for the north. Right now, um, it's pretty steady, like the, the projected student growth for the Miracle Beach School through the next 15 years fluctuates within the capacity that we have for that school based on all the information that we have through birth rates and our, our housing projections. So it looks like we can, uh, we can accommodate growth at that school site. And on the school site right now, we presently operated before and after school care facility. And they use a multi-purpose room and it uh, serves families that want to drop their kids off early in the morning and then pick them up late. So it is, it's in, in essence provides coverage from about 7.30 in the morning till 5.30 at night. Oh, wow. So we have that part covered quite well and we've been doing that for, for quite a few years. I agree that there is a gap on the childcare side, so specifically infant, toddler and preschool. But we haven't had the sort of family or staff pressure around that that we have at other sites that seems to be managed inside community. Now, when we are looking to make decisions around child care facilities, we, we um, put polls out to parents and we rely heavily on child care studies that are done by Comox Valley Child Development and municipal partners. I know when we worked with Cumberland, they had done an excellent study of space for space need requirements around child care. And I think there is something done through the Child Development Agency as well, or Comox Valley Child Care. So, but we're, we're feeling, fingers crossed, comfortable about the North End and NIDES. Hugh Band and Miracle Beach are both busing schools and we have good coverage of both. And NIDES does distant education and some bricks and mortar around a fine arts academy. So we have probably 150 kids there three to four days a week. So it's a really active, busy school. Lots of interesting programming going on at that site. Thanks, I, Ian. Maybe just, just one more quick one. I just want to steer it a little bit more back toward recreation because that's uh, the topic that we're, we're on right now. I was now. just going to talk about recreation because right. uh, when we did our, our, uh, our strategic plan on rec, uh, one of the things we found out was the underutilization of the facilities during the day. 
And there used to be apparently a lot more participation um, from SC71, um, where they take the kids for swimming or whatever, or skates during the, the times that aren't peak times, because we have these facilities running. But apparently, it, due to operation cutbacks, it's, it's no longer happening. And I, I was just up in Campbell River and I saw two buses coming in in the middle of the afternoon to their, to their sports center. So just what's up with that? It's a tough one because most of that is uh, left to school-based decisions. But I know that transportation costs when you're going to do field trips during the day or run programs, that it, it is expensive to run a charter to get to these uh, programs. And there is with the shifting dynamic of uh, two parents working, it's tougher to, to collect, you know, drivers, volunteer drivers. So there are, there are challenges around utilization during the day for schools that are a little further removed. But beyond that, I don't think I can provide and perhaps uh, through the superintendent later, we could give Make more feedback. Over time, we can support between the sports or the threat commission and, and, and some of these programs. Very likely. We can work together on this. Okay. Great. Thank you. Next, we have Mayor Minions. Uh, through the chair, thank you. And I recognize that this is rec based, so I'll just make a quick comment. I just wanted to thank Ian for providing those updates. It sounds like you guys are leading the way on some of those uh, initiatives with the GHG, so it's really nice to hear. Uh, just being from the town of Comox, I just wanted to note the 700 units are not yet approved, but I noted the need for maybe some further communications on which stages some of these larger developments that very well could be coming are at. The community consult stage is meant to kind of look at the school district and see what those capacity needs are. Um, but we can look at offline how we kind of communicate what the actual applications are, what they look like, and what they could project it to be. So just wanted to say I noted that while those are not uh, approved by council yet, that we can definitely improve maybe communications at what stage things are at, as it looks like there could be some growth coming to Comox in that corridor that you mentioned. So thank you for that very informative presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Director Arbor. Yeah, thanks. What what a great update from uh, the school district on, on all things and going well beyond recreation, which I really appreciate. And I want to thank your leadership for all the work you're doing on number three, number two. I was going to touch on number one specifically, which is some of your problems around capacity around Cumberland in the south. And um, um, just briefly, and then I'll, I'll go bring it back to rec. Uh, but uh, yeah, I guess the question in the South too is what will be the role of the new Union Bay school site? Um, you may not have the answer today, but that's definitely an opportunity both for um, obviously capacity issues, but also potentially for recreation facilities, discussions we could have. I, I might be considering creating a parks and recreation service for specific to area A. So engaging early with the school district would be great. Um, and the only Feedback and I see, uh, I don't know if that's in response or just another comment, but uh, um, in regards to recreation specifically, I, you really got me excited with your GHG emissions plan. And I would say that personally, I would be much more excited for us to look at um, helping the Vanier situation with your two and a half million dollar requirement and potential heat exchange. I think we're jumping the gun by building a new arena before we actually look at what we already have and, and can actually capture and send some of that energy uh, towards the school, towards reducing GHG. So just my personal opinion. Thank you. And Trustee Waite. Thank you. Well, I did the same thing as <laughs> you did, Mayor Brown. Um, two, two things. I, I, um, you may not realize that the information that um, Ian shared with you about the business case being announced um, was hot off the press. So our press release went out at 1.30 today. Um, yeah. And just so you know, I could tell there wasn't as much awe in the room. As, <laughs> as, and I just wanted to let you know that, that it was hot, be. hot off the be press. <laughs> and I will call it and be interesting to see what our team at the district calls it. It's always intriguingly um, anticipatory what we may or may not get from the Ministry of Education and Child Care. So we were ecstatic that we are at the next step, just that little bit closer to being able to provide the kind of um, educational space 
that that we want to have for the children in our district and in this case um, for the students in Cumberland. So I just wanted to share that with everyone so that now you can be really excited as we <laughs> as we go to this we're not quite there yet, but that we can that we're that next step in the intricacies of um, governmental um, funding announcements and, and funding maybe okay you can go to the next step piece and the other piece and circling back to recreation i think as a district we're we're always interested in learning and working with um to to our ability or the the opportunities and work that may be happening on district property including the um the we got them wrong sports complex and the and the fields and and I find it intriguing that you have to the two educational um, partners in our community, which hold the land for where the sports plex is and the aquatic center. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting kind of uh, partnership ish mm -hmm. um, agreements that we have as community coming together. I just wanted to share that. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for providing that context. And it's good to celebrate successes. Right. So thank you. Um, next, we have Director Hardy. Yeah, thanks. Um, similar type question to Director Arbor in regards to uh, Comox Elementary and just wondering what the plans are with the school district for that particular piece of property. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Such a great question. <laughs> I, again, I think we wanted to keep it rec focused and maybe yeah. you could take specific questions about sure. schools. So um, my, my second comment would be then, uh, I'll, I'll talk to you afterwards about that. Sure. <laughs> um, but in regards to, again, I think we've mentioned a few different times, uh, again, the, the CBRD board and the rec, uh, the rec commission in regards to uh, kind of fully understanding uh, short-term versus long-term, the certainty of, again, some of uh, our recreation facilities on on school district property. So I get and understand schools are going to have to expand. Uh, but again, when we start looking at um, either high school or or uh, Vanny school with regards to artificial turf and then artificial turf and, and just trying to understand uh, if if there's, you know, a means of getting some certainty uh, for both parties here down the road with regards to how that's going to work. I think from a keeping it in a recreation lens. When we do our upgrades to a school or expansions now, we're much more efficient with the way we, we do a smaller footprint and go up so that you get those um, efficiencies out of your foundation and your heating and cooling plant. And so I think in a lot of those schools where we, we, are, where we have shared recreation facilities, we actually have a generous amount of land. And I think we can move forward with some certainty that we can um, meet our needs and the community's needs around that. And certainly um, there's there's the place for the discussion to have those important conversations. Thanks, Ian. Next, we have Director Grant. I'm going to segue my Comox Elementary question into a recreation <laughs> question, if I can. But I'm wondering, uh, we're, we're looking at a, a couple of projects in Comox, a skate park and possibly a pump track. Is there any recreation opportunities at the Comox L site? And second to that, when you're talking about that corridor up there with all the housing, there's probably closer to 13 to 1400 units scheduled for up there. So just. You just made my day. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, they're in the pre planning stage, but they're, they're on the books. So. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Director Grant. I can answer uh, both those. So I think Comox Elementary, where we've entered into a good partnership with the town of Comox, is around uh, is around a dog park, and I think that's that's good for the families and gets people out and about and collaborating in a space. And I think we've we've really balanced off what we see as a, uh, a really important asset for the for the Board of Education around having land in Comox. Um, you know, understanding that we don't have a lot of uh, thoughts around where that's going to go right now, except for the fact that we need to have some space there. And so we're using it as an opportunity to share with our community partners. So I think the dog park venture with Comox has been very successful. And the second piece around the skate park and the pump track, I've uh, been working closely with Comox staff 
on looking at some of the options. And we're, we're looking at an area close to Highland as one of the potential locations for that. And again, I think it fits well into uh, how we can collaborate because the, the positives of having skate parks and pump tracks are, are really high in what they mean for kids in the community. And there's lots of great studies to support that, which are reviewed prior to taking the information forward to the board. And so I think there's there's certainly some opportunity in working closely with Comark staff around that. Wonderful, thanks. So I don't see any more lights on and no hands up online. Um, so we all good with dispensing with the recreation. <laughs> so we have on the on the table for today to discuss uh, the field study, the uh, the aquatic study, and the um, ice study. So we'll just assume since everybody's oh oh there is somebody online. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Charlie Kerr, go ahead. Thanks, thanks Chair, and thanks uh, to staff for the, the presentation um, on our work as a rec commission. I guess my question is also for our, our school district colleagues. I'm curious um, if there's been any analysis or if that's even part of regular operations of the school district to understand trends with sports. Um, you know, Director Greaves spoke to um, some of the issues that came up that we noticed through the, the assessments and the reports around the usage of our facilities uh, during the daytime. And I'm, I'm kind of genuinely just curious around what the school might be noticing around um, registration or uh, participation in certain sports over another. Like what are, the, what are we seeing trending with our younger generation in terms of what the, the, the kids and the children and the youth are interested in playing and participating in? and how that might um, influence also maybe some of the priorities we have at the Rec Commission. So we'll just turn it over to Ian, thank you. Okay, well certainly, I'll be careful with that one. <laughs> uh, the, the trends I think match the community trends is that soccer is an incredibly popular, but we're seeing growth in other sports as well because I, there's a, there's a strong trend in the school district to focus in on sports that are, um, that are inclusive to all. So interestingly, um, every, every year we do pickleball classes um, and uh, they're because it's, it's a ton of fun and everybody can play. So there are, there's a, there's a push um, ultimate is taught in all our PE classes as well, which is a, which is a great sport that you don't see a lot of. Um, we also get registration in uh, some of the other things like lacrosse and field hockey and rugby has had a resurgence in the school district. Highland has a program going for the first time in a long time and it's created a real vibrancy and energy inside that school. And I'm presently doing some work with Town of Comox staff around how can we create a rugby field in the vicinity of Highland. So soccer always popular, but we're certainly seeing field hockey, lacrosse, ultimate rugby and pickleball as being popular sports. Very good to know, thank you. Anything further, Director Jonica? No, that's great, thank you. It sounds like field sports, um, the primary trending sports, so thanks. Thank you. Okay, so I'll turn it over to if there's no further questions, turn it over to James to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this um, elected officials forum, as the chair has mentioned, it was meant to cover two, two primary aspects. One was our uh, update on around the recreation complexes and, and strategic planning that the commission did. And then to focus more on some of the capital projects that each jurisdiction has been working on or will be working on over the coming uh, months and, and, um, and this term of office. Uh, Ian, I think I was going to turn it over to you initially, but I think you probably already uh, shared with us everything that you were going to talk about on the capital side. Yes, I did. I just <laughs> maybe a little jump the gun, but did the whole thing. That's okay. No, I, I didn't want to interrupt. So, um, so with that, we would move into the regional district has a couple of presentations. Sorry, Director oh. Cole Hamilton, you have a yeah. question. I was wondering if it's possible now to ask non-REC related questions. About <laughs> I turned my light off because I was going straight non-REC on that. But. 
Uh, about the capital plan? Yeah. Yeah, for, um, for the school district. If, if uh, is that so, is that okay? Okay. Yeah. So I was um, just want to say, Ian, thanks so much for the presentation. That was informative on a whole lot of levels, and certainly the <laughs> the challenges of um, of projecting um, student growth, student population growth, and where it's going to happen is going to be significant, particularly as we um, as we see de greater density happening. And I know that the province announced a couple of months ago plans to for zoning changes, which will allow up to four individual residences on every single family lot in British Columbia, which I think is a challenge probably for everyone who sits around this table, figure out how to make that work well. I'm just wondering, I'm imagining it's probably a large factor that you're now sort of playing into your uh, pr projections. I'm just wondering how... Um, with increasing density and particularly that sudden move that's likely to occur in, uh, in response to that, how that feeds into your projections for the future. Uh, it, it certainly does. I think for us, what we're really most interested in is establishing really good yield rates. And that is something that's really varied over time. So traditionally we could always say, well, every single family home produced 1.8 children if between kindergarten and grade 12. And so now the numbers, they don't apply that way anymore. So we, we go for greater fidelity. So we look at uh, single family home, single family home, if it has a carriage house, a uh, single family home that is more than one story, multi-story uh, town homes. And I think what we're finding is that the yield rates have really transitioned over time, uh, whereas you would never really get very many kids out of multi-family units now we do so we're working hard on that and and we've um we've essentially analyzed every property in the comox valley where the kids live and what style of home they're in to the best of our ability and had conversations with all the planning staff to sort of nail those yield rates down so that when we see these um and that's where this good communication is so important because as we have units that come forward we want to look at what the developments are that are coming, what kind of homes they are, and how that will will drive the volume of kids out of school. Thanks. And, and I was just curious as uh, as density increases, the sort of the need for um, more more classrooms will occur in areas which are already fully built out. Um, and I imagine that's a situation which is occurring across BC is the, the subject of kind of densifying school properties, adding more classrooms to existing properties. Is that part of the, the way schools are considering growing in the future? That's exactly right. So that Comox Courtney corridor that we're so challenged by because Valley View is 100% of capacity, Aspen is a classroom or two over capacity. Uh, Rob Road is fully at capacity. Brooklyn is probably one and a half over capacity and airports a, a titch under right now. And so a big piece for us is how do we take a existing school site and effectively add on to it to, you know, accommodate those kids that are coming in. So that's, re that's really important. And, and when we do do those sorts of preliminary reports for the ministry that will lead us to where we're getting to now with Cumberland, we have to have a demonstrated overpopulation for a, quite a long period of time because we're competing with the likes of Souks and Surrey for, you know, for those precious dollars to expand. There's be very, very few new schools built um, in a community. They would, the preference is to expand on what you have because it's much more cost effective. Yeah. Let's get to understand that reality. Okay. Don't see any further lights. Oh, wait, there is someone online. Director Jolicard, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, I guess I'm curious from the school district's perspective in its capital yeah. planning process, and I'm really happy to hear about all the uh, projects in the docket. Um, what process do you incorporate to understand the equity perspectives of where the schools make to, uh, the school district makes its decisions around investments in capital uh, as it relates to different neighborhoods and different equity seeking groups? I think that's a really good question. So when we when we move forward with capital requests, we look at we look at quite a few pieces. We look at the uh, you know, I'm I'm looking at the health of the school in many different ways. 
you know, and we we're trying to achieve balance amongst our schools so that so that when we that a school in any neighborhood or any given area should be on par with every other school. So we've and I'll and I'll use Courtney Elementary as an example. We've probably um, in the ten years I have been here, relative to other schools of the same size, we probably put four times as much money into that because we were in a situation that didn't that wasn't very equitable. It hadn't received much in the way of capital funding for a very long time, and and now when you go in, it has been completely has a brand new building envelope. It's modern and attractive looking. It has new flooring and new fixtures in the bathrooms and new windows and new heating plant. Um, and and simply it's a it's a function for us that we're we're trying to create a situation with balance. At the same time, we have to look at physical plants and things that that need to be replaced. So we'll do those. So there's lots of behind the walls work that we do that that people don't see that the school might get an awful lot of money and and uh, doesn't look any different, but we're really trying to create uh, create good balance amongst our communities. I think that's uh, that's certainly one of the values um, that we've taken forward within our department. Thank you. All right, so we'll pass it over to James to introduce the next speaker. Great, thanks very much. So, um, so as I was saying, the the regional district, the town, the city, and the village of Cumberland, I think, all have presentations to make uh, here about the capital projects that are either are underway or or soon to start. Um, and so, on the regional district side, we've got Mark Ratton will be presenting first on our sewer extension south project, and uh, and then we'll introduce uh, Chris LaRose to talk about conveyance and Mark Harrison to talk about a couple of uh, trail projects. So, over to Mark. Great, thanks, James. I uh, have a PowerPoint presentation, just a couple of slides. Just give Lisa a minute to bring it up. Okay, great, thanks. So, why is this project so important to the regional district and to the community? Um, there's there's several reasons, and I'll just touch on some of them here. So, the protection of Bain Sound. <clears throat> Bain Sound has the largest shell fishery in BC, producing 70% of BC's cultured oysters. And uh, recent norovirus outbreaks highlight the importance of protecting the marine waters of Bain Sound. There's aging septic systems in this area. Um, a recent analysis shows that the majority of these systems are over 25 years old, and many are much older than that and predate the introduction of provincial regulation. The dwelling density in Royston and Union Bay is very high, so the lots there are very small, comparable to what you would find in a municipal fully serviced setting. There's poor soil conditions in this area. Um, in recent work that Island Health has done, they've indicated that soils along the waterfront may not allow for adequate attenuation of wastewater before it travels into Bain Sound. And in areas away from the beach, tight soils are often found with restrictive clay and silt layers, which doesn't allow the, the treated water to, to penetrate down. Also, there's high seasonal water tables in this area. So the cumulative impacts from poorly functioning septic systems can have an adverse impact on the environment and on public health. Also, this area is designated for growth. So a high quality long-term sewer solution is crucial for this area to support that growth. And uh, lastly, this is a really important project to support reconciliation with the Comox First Nation. Um, a new regional system will include service for Comox First Nation treaty settlement lands south of Courtney. And the project, um, as mentioned before, in, in, will, will help to ensure safe access to shellfish for Comox First Nation for food, social, and ceremonial purposes. So a lot, lots of uh, important factors related to this project. So here's a map that shows kind of the, the scope of the South Sewer Extension Project. Um, and the main part of the scope is a 13 kilometer sewer force main from Union Bay to Courtney. And that force main feeds into the existing kind of core system that serves Courtney and Comox now. There's also two local pump stations as part of the first phase of the project that, uh, that serve Royston and Union Bay. Due to the linear nature of this area and the sparse population, 
the servicing is really expensive and the, and the regional district's been challenged over the years to try to create a service in this area. Also shown on the map are future development areas, including the Comox Treaty Settlement lands, kind of in a pinkish color, and the Union Bay Estates lands in gray. Project costs for the first phase are estimated at 63 million. And in April, 2023, the province confirmed a $30 million grant um, through the Critical Community Infrastructure Fund for this project. In addition, the project includes significant partner funding from Indian Bay Estates and from Comox First Nation. So we are uh, seeking support for this project um, from the province and from the public through a liquid waste management planning process. In, in June of last year, the EASC and the Sewage Commission supported development of, of the project through an addendum to the liquid waste management plan that was already underway for the Comox Valley sewer system. So you can see this diagram here kind of shows how those two LWMP planning processes fit together. Um, since the time that we started the liquid waste management plan, there's been further engineering and design uh, with Class C cost estimates, uh, a value engineering workshop to try to, to maximize the value of the project. Public and technical advisory committees have been formed and four joint meetings have been held covering a considerable amount of background and technical material. Um, the public and technical advisory committee has achieved consensus on several motions with re related to phasing, force main alignment, collection systems, the Royston pump station and septic system, septic systems. Um, and in April and May, the steering committee, which is made up of the electoral area services committee and the chair of the sewage commission uh, met to consider the project and endorse the motions put forward by the PAC TAC. So next steps for the sewer extension south project. Um, the, the next immediate step is public consultation. So we've got three community events planned for late spring, just coming up in June. We've got consultation with First Nations in the plan area, including Comox First Nation, which has been ongoing throughout the project and, and will continue. And the technical team will then proceed with preparing the draft addendum report over the summer. And in the fall, that report will be presented to the Public and Technical Advisory Committee, and then to the Steering Committee and the Sewage Commission. And the final addendum is targeted for submission to the province in 2024. And that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions that there might be. Great. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, it's a big project. We've been working on it for a while. Any questions? Director McCollum, go ahead. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation and the update on this. Um, it'll be a, a real wonderful thing to see this project underway. Um, I moved here over 17 years ago to one of those neighborhoods, and we thought uh, sewer was imminent. So um, <laughs> this time is hopefully the the um, has all the magic components to make it all come together. Um, I was just wondering if you wanted to speak a little bit toward the phasing of how this will roll out when uh, when we are successful in getting that line um, down to Union Bay and how um, different areas along that that line will connect and, and what kind of timelines we're looking at for that. Yeah. Um, so like I said, the, the project will be done in phases. The first phase is what, what I described here in the presentation. So it is the $63 million scope. It's the, the 13 kilometer force main and the two pump stations. Um, that really, you know, although very expensive for a relatively small population, it does create the kind of backbone of the system. And once that is in place, we'll be, so the, the timing is hard to predict, but we'll be working with other communities and neighborhoods that are along the system. And as grant opportunities come up, as, um, as neighborhood interest kind of galvanizes around wanting to join, you know, we'll be putting projects together to, to bring that, that neighbor, that particular neighborhood in, like, like Kilmarnock, for example, is one of the neighborhoods targeted as kind of the next phase. 
Um, but with, with this phase 1A infrastructure in place, the, the economies for those future neighbourhoods start to look a lot better, and um, including them up front. Thanks for that. Next we have Director Arbor. Yeah, thanks. The project is imminent, so you better move back to Area A soon. Um, I, while the school district is here, I thought I would mention that one of the key aspects of the project has been to collect partners. Uh, when staff talks about uh, union-based states and Comox First Nation, there is no project without those partnerships. It's currently a pretty small pool of residents. So I understand through staff that there's been some initial discussions around uh, potentially servicing Royster Elementary and then just for the school district to consider that, I just want to show appreciation um, and just know as well that this could also, um, you know, for the long term, for the next for the next fifty years, also help with the union base site I was referencing earlier. That that could provide a setup. Every dollar counts, and every partner counts in this project. So I just want to thank the school district for their consideration. Great, thank you. Any further questions? All right, I don't see any online. I guess you're off the hook, Mark. Thank you. All right, I'll pass it over to Chris. And sorry, I was remiss in introducing uh, Mark Rutten's our general manager of engineering services and, and Chris Lowe's is our senior manager of water and wastewater services. So Chris, over to you. Thanks, James. And through the chair, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, after five years of planning and consultation, I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar or somewhat familiar with the conveyance project that we have planned. Uh, so it's meant to be a quick update, so I'm going to keep it pretty high level and just touch on some of the project elements that I think or have or will be generating the most attention from the public. Uh, but I'm happy to get into more detail in the Q&A section after. So after 11 meetings uh, with the liquid waste management planning process tech, or technical and public advisory committees uh, over three years, ending in 2021, um, an extensive consultation with, uh, with Comox uh, and the town of Comox, the preferred conveyance project route was, was selected in early 2021, and that's shown on the slide here. Uh, so this is a, a major step towards finally resolving the uh, outstanding environmental risk uh, along Wilmer Bluffs, which is um, shown by the, the faint blue line along the foreshore. So the existing sewer main runs from the Courtney pump station at the far left of the screen, um, most of the way along the intertidal zone. Uh, but that section in particular is, uh, is of significant environmental risk and is the key driver for this project and the liquid waste management planning process. Um, in, in contrast with the water treatment project that was completed in late 2021, um, which was largely out, out of the public site. Um, you know, people could drive up there and take a look at it if they wanted to, but um, but it was very much a greenfield site uh, out of uh, out of most people's site. Um, whereas this project you know, bisects um, all of our communities um, and directly cuts directly across uh, part of the city of Courtney electoral area B, the Comox First Nation IR one, downtown Comox. Um, and, uh, and then a sensitive environmental area at Lazo Marsh over near the treatment plant. So starting at the left, just briefly, um, the project involves a new Courtney pump station. So directly across the street from the existing one. Um, and then a new overland force main to, uh, to, to move us completely off of the, the um, intertidal zone. Uh, so it will run along the Comox Road, or approximately Sea View, uh, which is near the bird viewing platform the Rotary Park, and then it will leave Comox Road and run along Seaview Road and then through the farm fields behind the first row of homes along Comox Road all the way to the west boundary of, of KFN, and then through IR1 up the hill into Comox, and then follow a route uh, through downtown, which I'll show in more detail in a subsequent slide. And then uh, the preferred solution that was chosen included a, uh, a tunneled section, which is shown in, in orange, which cuts through the highest or under the highest point of land to try and um, reduce pumping costs and GHG emissions over the lifespan of the project and reduce risk. 
uh, before daylighting again and then continuing under the marsh over to the treatment plant. So the project's being delivered under two construction contracts, a, a design build, which is considered a progressive uh, project delivery method for everything outside of the town, um, with the exception of the Comox pump station, which is part of that scope. And then the Comox crossing will be delivered or is being delivered by a design bid build, which is a traditional, traditional project delivery method. So the new Courtney pump station, just zooming in on the far west side of the uh, westernmost part of the project, it will be located immediately across the road from the existing Courtney pump station, that brick building, which is immediately next to the Kuskusum site. Uh, so this will, the shift in location across the road will, will increase the resistance to seismic um, risk and, and events uh, by removing it or shifting it farther away from the river channel. Uh, the KFN um, and the farmer who uh, sold the CBRD, the property for the station, um, have had some input into the aesthetics of the of the structure, um, which is likely to take the appearance of some sort of farm farming structure, with some inclusion of KFN art on the side facing the Comox Road. The new station will be built to uh, withstand the 2100 flood level anticipated in this area, which takes into account the projected impacts of climate change and sea level rise, as far as the best to the best of our knowledge at this point. And it um, will be built to the most modern seismic standards and should, should serve the community for significantly longer than the 40 years that we've got out of the existing structure. So during the planning stage for this project, um, the KFN implemented their cultural heritage policy and the CBRD have committed to fully, full compliance with that policy and delivery of this project. So given the very high density of archeological sites along Comox Road, uh, special measures have been taken to, to avoid or minimize further impact to the sensitive archeological sites. The first one being um, shifting off of Comox Road, as I mentioned, to the agricultural land, which is um, kind of um, more than 200 meters back from the water um, and away from the, the areas of high of dense archeological um, materials. And then um, for the crossing of IR1 itself, we're planning to reuse the existing trench. Um, so the photo on the right shows the uh, a section of the, the original force main installation, which is roughly in front of where the K KFM band office is. Um, and so, yeah, as you can see that dark layer on the top of the trench, well, first thing you, you note that uh, the safety measures have changed a little bit in the last 40 years. There's no, no shoring shown on that, on that trench. Um, but yeah, the dark layer on the top of the trench is the layer of, uh, of midden material darkened by the remains of, of, of ancient fires. Um, and so by reusing the trench, we, uh, we, we hope to avoid um, disturbing those undisturbed midden materials that, that would, would otherwise exist. The next thing I wanted to highlight is that, um, so in the early planning phases of the project with the town of Comox, of course, there was a focus on on um, selecting the um, optimal alignment through the town, uh, but we also, um, the town took the opportunity to review their capital plans and, and identified five surface work projects that, um, that were uh, planned to occur along that alignment. And so the, these will be delivered in conjunction with the project. So through, through the town, it's not just about installing the, the the, um, the force main, but also about delivering these five critical projects for the town, which include two roundabouts on the left on the western side, one at uh, Glacier View Drive and the other at Rodello, and then a large uh, complete street replacement between Church and Norden, that's the rectangle right in front of the Marina Park, and then um, some major rehab of, of the surface infrastructure along Balmoral, Balmoral and, uh, and Torrance. So as you can imagine, a project of, of this magnitude will have a pretty significant disruption on traffic patterns. Uh, so the CBRD engaged urban systems early last year 
and then we worked together um, in consultation with uh, the full range of, of stakeholders of, uh, that use this arterial route between the two communities um, to, to inform a, a traffic management strategy. And the, the principal outcome of that work is that um, that flow will be converted to unidirectional flow along Comox Road uh, for the duration of any work along that corridor. Um, and so the, the flow will go from east to west, um, and then eastbound traffic will be diverted around following that route highlighted in blue, which will up up Ryan, down Guthrie, and back down Anderton into, into town. Um, whereas the bike, bike, bike uh, traffic will be maintained in both directions to encourage that alternate form of, of, of transportation. Um, so if, Delays eastbound should be kept to a minimum, um, and, sorry, westbound. And then eastbound um, delays will be mitigated by the fact that uh, you know, we're looking at almost entirely a right hand turns, so no cross traffic um, turns of that diverted flow. Um, so we're looking at you know, approximately a 12 to 18 month duration of, of this alternate traffic flows starting about middle of next year. And then the final piece that I wanted to highlight um, is a very recent change uh, confirmed by the Commission on May 9th. Um, so one of the key elements of the uh, project scope was that uh, tunneled section under Lazo Hill to avoid the, the highest point of land. Um, but that became problematic um, during the procurement process, which is now um, nearing completion for the design build. Um, so there's significant concerns raised about the ability to undertake that tunneling work without um, the risk of, uh, or mitigating the risk of frack out of the drilling fluid, um, which could have uh, impacts to, to the surface or potentially to drinking water wells in the area. Um, and, uh, and so we've, we've revisited the options that were shortlisted in the liquid waste management planning process. Um, and uh, so one of those options was cut and cover uh, for the pipe over Lazo Hill. And so that uh, after much deliberation and analysis, um, that, that, that option has now been um, refreshed and, and chosen for, for crossing of Lazo Hill. Um, so just today we met with the technical and public advisory committees and, and let them know about the, ch about the change. Um, and you can see the two potential uh, route options going from roughly Lazo and Moreland. Uh, so one the preferred being um, cutting down Curtis Road and up up to the treatment plant, but uh, as a potential plan B, um, the pre-existing route down Moreland and across Lazo Marsh. And finally, um, just a high-level timeline. Uh, so we plan to be, we, we hope to be completing procurement late this fall um, and we're tracking for start of, of construction early next year in March or April. Um, and looking at the end of 2025 for project completion. So that's, that's it for me, but happy to answer any questions about this project. Great, thanks, Chris. So I was just reflecting that, um, you know, our, our new water treatment plant is the biggest, most expensive uh, project that we've done. And certainly it had its complexities with drilling and conveyance, but, uh, do you, do you feel like this project is the most complex project that the regional district's ever taken on? Uh, well, certainly in my experience, definitely a lot more complex than the water treatment project without, without question. We've kind of checked all the boxes in terms of complexity. <laughs> <laughs> the traffic management alone. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, it looks like we do have some questions online. Um, I think I saw... Uh, Councillor Blacklock, go ahead. Oh, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead, thank you. Thank you, Chris, for the uh, update on the conveyance project. Big change, obviously eliminating the uh, directional drill drilling under the old Knob Hill. Um, my question is re with respect to the uh, engagement of the land agent who was hired to secure property rights through this area. It's my understanding that that person has been out in the community negotiating with property owners. 
and even in some cases um, uh, negotiating various uh, real estate deals with respect to property swaps. Now that we're going away from the drilling, what will be the fate of that land agent's contract and what will be the fate of the property at 98 uh, Beach Street? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. Um, our properties agent, uh, Jim Richies, has been working very hard for us over the last two years, looking to working to secure the required uh, properties. Um, and he's done a, an, an excellent job. We've, we've secured all of the um, right of ways required for the agriculture land um, reserve component of the alignment. Um, for, for this section, this is you know, very much hot off the press, maybe not quite as much as the SD71 news today, but but it is uh, very much de developing. So we um, we are communicating with the property owners that we've been negotiating with. Um, so that's happening today and tomorrow. Um, and so looking to to uh, to back away from step away from those negotiations. Um, so Jim and his team will be helping to to extricate ourselves from 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 those processes. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's that's that's very much developing, but 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 underway. Great, thank you. And next we have um, Councillor Shalito. Thanks, Chair. Um, and thanks for the presentation. Um, I guess probably unsurprising, my questions around traffic management. Um, I, I'm curious around any uh, traffic management studies that have been done or any assessments around the impact on emergency services uh, both fire and and ambulance in particular, given the the, the location of the hospital in East Courtney, um, I'm, I'm wondering if you can perhaps uh, speak to that. And then um, you mentioned 12 to 18 months, and so I'm also curious around if there's any seasonality in traffic studies um, uh, that have been that have impacted when that uh, 12 to 18 months will start and when it will finish. Sure. Yeah. So, so absolutely. Our, our, um, you know, we, when we were developing a list of the key stakeholders that we needed to consult with um, in, in, in crafting the, the traffic management strategy, emergency services were, were top of the list. Uh, so we, we met with them several times last year, um, kind of beginning, middle of end of, the, of that process. And um, I think they, they were strongly reassured by the, uh, by the approach that we're taking, which is um, to have the, you know the the technology and the staffing in place um, at every you know, at every construction site along um, any of the uh, project alignment to ensure um, immediate access by by emergency vehicles in either either direction. So that um, that restriction on westbound um, traffic um, will not apply, obviously, to uh, to emergency vehicles, and we'll have um, technology in place that will. Um, Force a force a signal change um, in the presence of sirens and lights. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's a priority, and we'll, we'll continue to be we'll continue to have close contact with the RCMP and ambulance and fire uh, during, before, during, and after the project. Um, and in terms of seasonality, um, you know, not not so much. I mean, certainly we've looked at um, at the seasonal fluctuations in traffic flow, and that's been fed into our modeling. Um, but it hasn't affected the timing of construction. Um, if, if, if I captured the gist of your question. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Thank you. So next we have Director Swift. Thanks, Chris. Uh, having been at the TAC PAC meeting this morning, I was uh, thinking about the Curtis Road um, route and how challenging that could be. And I'm wondering if any consideration was take, given to extending the road further down Lyleso and hooking into the Brent Road uh, intersection there. Yeah, de definitely. Um, we've, we've looked at that, you know, that's been a kind of an, an obvious uh, choice from, from the start. Um, when we were, when we had settled on tunneling through Lazo Hill, it was kind of precluded by the, the grade line, the hydraulic grade line, the elevation. Um, now that we've shifted away from horizontal directional drilling, it becomes technically viable, um, but it is significantly, it is a significantly longer alignment um, with, with 
corresponding, you know, very significant um, capital cost implications. So we're, we are, um, as I highlighted, we're still um, assessing options for getting from that corner of um, of Lazo and Moreland area to the, to the plant, and we will be we will be kind of keeping an eye on those costs and and um, and uh, criteria in comparison to the to the Lazo road. But it is you know it's over a kilometer and a half longer, which is on the order of between three to five million dollars. Um, so our work now is focused on on um, on due diligence with the most direct route um, along Curtis. If that if that route were to to um, to, to raise some some red flags, then we'd be looking down to looking at the other two. Thank you. Okay, can you bring up online? I don't see. I don't see any hands in the room or online. All right. Thanks, Chris. So pass it over to James. Thank manager of parks and Mark will um, introduce a couple of projects on the parks and greenways work plan. So Mark, over to you. Thank you, James, um, through the chair. So uh, the CBRD Parks Department does have a number of capital projects on the books for 2024. So these are just uh, a couple of our main uh, trail projects that we have planned. So the first of those um, is the Lazo Greenway multi-use path. So that is a, it is a partnership project that we're working with the town of Comox and with the uh, Ministry of Transportation on. It is a three kilometer trail um, that extends basically adjacent to uh, Lazo Road between uh, Butcher's Road uh, down to um, Sand Pines Road. And it's also working in conjunction with um, a town of Comox upgrade to um, to the road infrastructure as well beyond Simba between Simba and uh, and the point homes um, section so it's um, within within the section between butchers road and Simba road um, we're looking at about 2.1 kilometers of asphalt and about 0.9 kilometers of gravel so it is a bit of a mix between a rural setting and the and the urban setting so in the more urban setting within the town of Comox it would be asphalt trail um, approximately three meters in width and then once we get into the more rural areas and through the Lazo kind of section we're looking at um, gravel trail which is uh, more kind of in line with what uh, the CVRD usually uses for, for surfacing on our trails. Um, we are trying to do a meandering trail alignment wherever we can. Um, in some sections where we're um, constrained within the road dedication, so we won't be able to necessarily meander the trail, but where we, wherever we can, we are going to try to meander that trail, which will obviously reduce the um, uh, environmental impacts. So we're gonna try to make sure our, our tree impacts are minimized. Um, and by meandering it as well, it'll it'll make for a, a nicer trail experience for all users. So the the Laza Greenway project, um, we did get uh, funding from the federal government through the Active Transportation Fund. Um, the the current project budget is approximately 1.7 million, which is at the 90% detailed design stage. So we are working kind of diligently to try to get to that 100% stage. Um, that grant is up to 60% of the project costs upon completion. Um, those costs are going to be separated out between the town of Comox and the CVRD and are based upon boundaries where the trail lies. So the town of Comox will be responsible for the costs within the town of Comox and CVRD within the CVRD boundaries. Um, costs that are exceeding the, the 60% total project costs will then be borne by each of those respective jurisdictions. Um, for CVRD, we've got um, an additional 350,000 set aside through community works funds to meet those project over costs within our jurisdiction. Um, in terms of timing, we're, um, we're very close to the 100% design. So we're hoping to kind of tender that soon spring summer of this year and hopefully begin construction in the fall of 2023 so fall this year and hoping to complete that project next year 
The other project that um, that is kind of one of our larger projects is the Denma Cross Island Trail. So it's the extension of that trail that we've been building out over a number of years on, on Denman um, Island well, along the uh, East Road, basically dedication. So this, this trail is a 3.5 kilometer trail. It'll go from um, Owl Crescent down to the Gravelly Bay Ferry Terminal. It's going to be a fully separated trail, about 2.2 meters wide. It will be a gravel trail within the East Road dedication. And as we are within the East Road dedication, we are um, we do have confines uh, on where the trail can be located. Um, so it'll largely be a fairly linear trail. Um, we did through this project get a statutory right away from a private owner for almost 400 meters of trail near the uh, Gravelly Bay area so that was um just a, a huge win for this this project um throughout the whole project we have been engaged with bc ferries um because they are looking at um upgrading their ferry terminal at the uh, gravelly bay site so those um um those, that process is kind of ongoing and we're making sure that our projects are coordinating to the best that we can so that project um, is currently, we've got a Class C budget at 700,000. Um, we did get a provincial active transportation fund grant. So this was provincial, the other one was a federal grant. This one is provincial, it does allow us uh, coverage of up to 70% of the project costs to a total of 490,000 approximately. The extra offset funds of approximately 180,000 are gonna be covered partially through community works funds and partially through our um, electoral area, Denman, uh, the Denman Island, sorry, uh, parks uh, reserves. The timing for that, we're, we're looking to go to tender here fairly soon um, and start construction again in the fall of this year and completing by 2024. So happy to answer any questions if there are any on these projects. Okay, are there any questions for Mark? Director McCullum. Thanks. Yeah, lots of good news uh, with this. I'm looking forward to trying out all these bike paths. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I was just, I, I'm assuming that when these are uh, complete, that they are, are maintained by our uh, local area park services, but um, I, I wasn't sure. Yeah, thanks. In terms of that that question, um, the the parks that are located within the town of Comox will be their um, their jurisdiction, so they will be maintaining that. And those that are within the um, the CBRD will be maintained under the electoral area services parks. Great, thanks. And Director Arbor. Yeah, thanks. I'd just like to mention that you know those two projects are are also part of our active transportation master plan for the valley and there's you know i can't, I can't remember the number of 40 or 60 million i'm looking around but it's a ton of projects and the difficulty as a region is how we're going to fund all this the province and federal government have have limited but there's just so many opportunities and with the school district here you know we're starting to gear up a little project around Royston school to improve safety and connectivity and I think the big question for me this term is how we're collectively put our minds to funding uh, the, the full suite of programs that are identified because they make a huge difference in our communities. Thank you. All right, I don't see any further questions. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. So um, we're gonna move into the village of Cumberland, the city of Court and then the town of Comox for presentations. So Rob Crisfield. Rob, I don't have your title, but um, Rob will be presenting for the Village of Cumberland on, uh, on at least one, one or two projects. Manager of operations. Manager of operations. Thanks, James. <laughs> <laughs> Just push your button there, Rob. There we go. There we go. So um, nice to meet uh, everyone in the room here. And I am, uh, you know, the village doesn't have anything hot off the press. And I think in the interest of time, we're 45 minutes behind. I think what I'm gonna do is not go through every slide because there's a lot of detail in some of these slides. I'd be happy to take questions at the end, but um, I think we'll start with the wastewater project since it's up on the screen there. So the village is um, has been working over the last, uh, I guess, uh, four or five years on 
uh, liquid waste management plan. We have been out of compliance for about 20 years. Um, and over those 20 years, we've gone through different iterations of a liquid waste management planning process. Um, we are finally see light at the end of the tunnel. We, uh, we have a stage two LWMP that has been approved by the province. We are moving into construction, hopefully in a couple months, breaking ground, equipment arriving on site. And the project has been broken into two phases. Um, phase one is really to bring us in compliance with our existing permit. And phase two will um, add tertiary treatment and a um, biochar media re reed bed that will um, uh, further um, treat pharmaceuticals and add um, treatment before the uh, the water is released into Maple Lake Creek. And one of the uh, one of the important aspects I, I think I need to highlight is um, when we started down the road on the on the LWMP again, we uh, quickly re quickly realized that um, you know, one of the options we looked at was removing flow or discharge into Maple Lake Creek during the summer. Um, to, it was around phosphorus treatment and levels, and we quickly realized that, you know, they'd be detrimental to, to the Trent River because in the summertime, Maple Lake Creek actually is 50% 50, 50 of that flow. And so we had to kind of put our thinking caps on and, and come up with a, a solution on how we could continue the flow through the summer, um, but greatly improve the, the water quality. And so that's what we've done. Um, Quickly, I'll kind of explain maybe the treatment process. We've uh, we have an existing headworks, and we've we'll be installing two new screens. They're press screens. Um, once the uh, the effluent goes through that, it goes into the lagoons. What happened in 2021 was we saw the the heat dome um, drastically impact the lagoons, and we realized that continuing to utilize the existing surface aerators wasn't going to be effective. And so we realized we'd have to actually look at subsurface aeration. And so that's going to be implemented in both lagoons, along with baffle curtains to direct the flow. So they get full treatment of that aeration before they are uh, sent for that effluent sent to the to the SAF units. And the SAF units are, are unique, actually, um, to the province and to Canada. They're used in California. They are they're approved under whatever certification. Um, they're, they're similar to a DAF unit, dissolved air flotation, which you guys use at the Brent Road uh, treatment plant, but they, um, they they take up a much smaller footprint and are more affordable. And we're pretty excited that we're able to utilize this, this technology in our treatment process. The, the water will then be uh, disinfected using uh, chlorine dioxide. Um, It'll be there'll be a retention uh, type structure, one for primary primary flows, and then one for excess wet weather flows. And the challenge with Cumberland is we have to treat our, all our flows. We have to disinfect all of our flows, um, regardless of the volume. And we see a twenty to one increase because of the combined sewers. We still have quite a few combined sewers in the community, and that uh, that is a Pretty significant challenge for the for the village to overcome. So we think we think we will achieve that. Well, we know we'll achieve that. And then we've now secured funding for phase two works, which will see the tertiary treatment um, added. So that'll be um, downstream of the SAF units. And then we'll construct these biochar media reed beds, which will add polishing outside of the regulated treatment works before it's discharged either into Maple Leaf Creek or one of the other options we're looking at is a wetland enhancement uh, in the surrounding area. So we've been working with Ecofish uh, on uh, different ideas on uh, how we can achieve that. Um, there's other works within, within the phase two works like channel relocation and um, maybe some trail stuff, but uh, still to be finalized. So yeah, it's the largest project the village is under they were undertaken and we're pretty excited to uh, finally get it moving. And of course, there's the the benefit to being sound that we heard about earlier with the uh, with the South Sierra project. So be happy to take any questions or I can move into the uh, number two dam project. 
Maybe I'll just throw a few, a few things in there that um, uh, Paul Nash is the project manager um, on this and uh, he's been uh, quite wonderful. Um, he's a very innovative guy and um, and one of the things um, that will be innovative uh, was mentioned by Rob is, is the reed bed and um, that it will um, treat to a level that it will um, treat pharmaceuticals, which um, to my knowledge will be the, the only municipality in the province uh, to that treatment level. So it's something that we'll be really proud of. In the country, the mayor says, yeah, okay, great. <laughs> All right, uh, we do have some questions. Director Grieve, go ahead. Thank you, Rob. Good to see you again. Um, I just thought I'd ask uh, a, a little question. I know that in a, in a, in a previous reiteration of, uh, of the South Sewer um, concept, uh, Cumberland was a partner. And, um, and we went through uh, uh, our liquid waste management plan. You guys suspended yours. And then at the, at the 11th hour, um, it was decided that uh, Cumberland would go back to its own original um, do it, do it yourself kind of Cumberland uh, way of doing things. Now, my my understanding was that you and Crystal Rose had a bet uh, of a case of beer um, in in 2015 as to which one's going to cost more money. And of course, we got 10 years there anyway, so it's obviously going to cost more money. So I just wonder who's going to be buying the case of beer, and even the case of beer is going to cost more money now. So. You got him on that one, did you? Okay. Yeah, I think, I mean, just, just to update people on the project costs, um, the original cost back when we completed stage two was 9.8 million. Um, you know, the, that cost of is, is increased because of the, um, because of the aeration, subsurface aeration we had to implement as well as we were looking at a pump system. So we, we tried to look at, GHG reduction, and one of the ways was to look at a gravity flow system versus a pump system. Uh, when we had all the flooding in November of 2021, we went from one extreme to another. We quickly realized that a uh, gravity flow system wasn't going to work on the site. Uh, Maple Lake Creek back up to a fairly high level that we'd never seen before, and we uh, again had to kind of uh, switch gears and, and look at a pump system. So. Um, that's added to the to the cost, um, but I still think the self sewer project is costlier. So I also just wanted to address the the, the first statement about um, you know choosing a, a Cumberland solution. Like Rob mentioned, we have uh, flows that are because we have so much inflow of um, stormwater into our system um, still that the difference between dry weather flows uh, and wet weather flows is one to 20, which is most um, municipalities are around one to three or one to two actually. So um, that in itself is a huge challenge. So then we would be pumping mostly water out of Cumberland into a regional system, which didn't really make sense if you're 20 times less the actual sewage <laughs> um, and then you're paying for all this water being pumped. So that was one of the reasons why an individual system made more sense. And then the other reason which Rob mentioned as well was that um, we would be pumping all of those flows directly out of Cumberland and, and Maple Creek, would, um, which feeds the Trent, would be suffering quite considerably in the summer. Um, so that was never accounted for in a regional system, how we would be sending all those flows that now make up 50% of the Trent and dry weather out of, out of the Trent and out of Cumberland down to a regional system. So those were the major considerations uh, when we were um, going uh, our, toward our individual system. Mayor Baird. Uh, thanks. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Chair, um, I wanted to say the same thing. So uh, thank you for that. Um, and the other uh, key factor of consideration is we would have had to continue to maintain ours as well as pay to join the South Sewer. So not practical for our community. Okay, any further questions? Please continue, Rob. All right, so moving on to uh, number two dam, which is probably, um, Oh, maybe it's as well known as the the, the sewer project. 
probably more well known because of the uh, the, the past history with some of the uh, Comox Lake um, what water advisories. Um, so the village has been working in the background over the last number of years on concepts um, and looking to secure funding because there was no way we could afford it without um, senior level government funding. And so after a couple of tries, we were able to secure 4.475 million to not only help with the, the rebuild of the number two dam, but also address um, some of the erosion that's been occurring over decades in the what we call the North Branch of the Perseverance Creek. So that's pretty exciting. Um, we've started some stakeholder engagement on that project. Uh, we're looking forward to sitting down with uh, Comox First Nations in uh, some meaningful consultation as well. And we hope to start design work this year. Um, and it's probably going to be a two year uh, construction phase. I think we need to address the <laughs> the erosion in the in the creek before we actually divert all the water down the creek uh, in order to rebuild number two down. So um, if people aren't too familiar with the water system in Cumberland, we have three sources. We have a groundwater well that provides about 30% water during uh, average day demand type conditions. And we have two surface water supplies. Uh, one is Allen Lake. It's the largest of our reservoirs. And then we have a series of four um, dams and lakes or reservoirs on the Cumberland Creek side. Um, very clean water. We, we've been able to maintain a filtration deferral for the last number of years, and um, we're just excited to get on with this project as well. So, uh, yeah, and, you know, some of the benefits really are um, safeguarding humans, you know, whether it's whether it's kind of the inundation zone uh, close to the village of Cumberland and and trail users, um, you know, our, one of the goals is to protect the environment. I think uh, I think it'll be a real benefit for fish habitat in the lower reaches of Perseverance Creek, and of course the uh, the water quality improvements we'll see in uh, Comox Lake. So, be happy to answer any questions on that one. Okay. I don't see any questions, none online. All right. All right. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Drew. Thanks, Rob. So I think um, next, Chris Davidson is from City of Courtney. And I think, Chris, you're on the line right now on, on the phone. Uh, that's correct. I'm on Zoom. Can you hear me, James? Yes, Chris. Thanks. Perfect. Uh, PowerPoint loaded up, and, um, and then it's over to you. Okay, are you loading the PowerPoint or am I sharing the screen? Go ahead and share the screen, please. Okay, can everyone see the presentation? Yes, we can. Great stuff, thank you very much. Thank you, James, and thank you, Chair Kettler. I'm Chris Davidson, Director of Engineering Services for the City of Courtney here today to present uh, Courtney Capital Opportunities for Regional Collaboration. So I have a couple of projects to present on. Uh, so first project, our South Courtney Sewer Project. Um, so as some may know, uh, we had a boundary extension back in uh, December of 2013. This was uh, extending the south boundary of the city. Uh, currently working on an options analysis to provide sanitary service to this area. Uh, we're hoping to complete very soon. Uh, we understand CBRD sewer extension south project is recently successful with the grant application, very likely to proceed. Uh, we further understand both projects contemplate a new sanitary main along Highway 19A. As such, we're seeking to align with the CBRD sewer extension south project. Hopefully, we can have um, you know some synergies there between the two projects, <laughs> share some project costs. The second project, Arden Lake Trail Multi-Use Pathway. Um, so it's actually a typo in that first bullet. So it's a multi-use pathway along Lake Trail Road. So it's from Lake Trail Elementary to Arden Elementary. So it's a little further than what's on the image there. Uh, the goal is to provide safe access for school children, other active transportation users. Estimated cost $980,000 um, in today's dollars. Uh, we understand the majority of the service area is outside of the city boundary. So you can see in the image there, city boundary in red, and it sort of extends past uh, sort of the normal boundary line there. 
And so for this one, uh, seeking shared funding for this proposed asset or, um, you know, a shared approach uh, to, deliver, to deliver this in collaboration with the regional district. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> Trying to save us some time. I appreciate that. <laughs> My pleasure, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't see any questions in the room and I don't see any online. So I'll say thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Chris. And Shelly Ashfield from the town of Comox is now to um, to present on the last the last item here for the elected officials forum. So Shelly. Try not to be. <laughs> thank you, Chair Cutler and elected officials for having me here today to speak to you. Um, I'm gonna focus on active transportation and some of the um, benefits on a regional scale. The other way. There. So the transportation team in the town of Comox uh, basically crosses over a number of departments, uh, the engineering and public works, and also our planning department and our parks department as well. This is an image of the town boundary, which is outlined in red. Um, we like to keep our residents guessing where they live. The gray area is the regional district, which the majority of us is surrounded uh, by the regional district. And then the green is the city of Courtney. Um, that's uh, directly adjacent to us along McDonald Road. So definitely a lot of collaboration happening within the town of Comox when we do some projects. How does the town address our active transportation? Um, up and foremost is our official community plan, uh, a number of bylaws that we have, and also our transportation master plan um, that we develop, and also regional transit um, system that we um, are part of with the regional district. We have a number of networks that we establish and keep up to date, including our road, uh, bicycle, pedestrian, parks, trails, and open spaces, and that dictates into our subdivision standard and specifications for new development and capital improvements. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be pointing at. There we go. Uh, the, the history for the town of Comox and our transportation plan. So uh, transportation study was done in 1994. Um, and when that study was done, the focus on that was mostly on vehicle traffic and parking. And it was very limited on discussions in regards to pedestrians, um, cycling, and transit improvements. In 2011, the town of Comox did a major uh, transportation master plan update um, since it was 16 years old. So the focus definitely switched into a lot of alternate modes of transportation. And we also aligned that with the town's OCP at the same time. So had um, quite an extensive um, community engagement, stakeholder consultants. Uh, regional district fire school um, as well. So it was, um, it, it took us about two years uh, to complete that at the same time with the OCP. We reflected at, at that when we updated that regional uh, or that master transportation master plan, we looked at new initiatives as well in regards to uh, the alternate modes of transportation in the regional growth strategy. And we looked at the sustainability strategy as well and making sure that our transportation was aligned with those strategies and plans as well. We did a minor update in 2020 because um, more so to ensure that the town uh, capital plan was still um, um, in, in the right alignment. Not much had happened from 2011 to 2020 to 20 in regards to development. Our OCP didn't get updated, so it was mostly a minor update to make sure our capital projects were still in line. I think our 2020 master plan is already updated because lots has happened in the last three years, um, especially in regards to density and growth and the new provincial legislation um, update that's going to be implemented in fall 2023. Um, so how we're going to deal with all of that transportation moving forward um, is going to be a challenge. Um, so part of the networks, uh, this is highlighting on the left is an image of our updated um, sidewalk and greenway um, network. Uh, the red is just showing existing sidewalks and pathways, and it just kind of highlights what's proposed, the connectivity, and looking at the regional district, looking at the city of Courtney as well, and setting up our capital plans moving forward. 
of our 100 and 100, just under 100 kilometers of road, we have just under 80 kilometers of sidewalk trails and greenways within the town. Um, and what we heard from the community back in 2011 when we did the major update was the lack of connectivity, um, uh, improved crossing opportunities, and we also then identified and reviewed our um, road standards um, to ensure that the widths are meeting best management practices and again having that shift from vehicle traffic to alternate modes of transportation. We also looked up at our standards for our local roads and identified the sidewalk priorities so we can set that in our capital plans. Very similar to the cycling network as well. Um, so we have a plan obviously highlighting um, what's existing and what's proposed. We have just under 30 kilometers of bike lanes within the town of Comox. Um, some of the identified issues that we've heard from the public in 2011 was the lack of east-west connectivity, specifically on Guthrie and Comox. Those have since been constructed. So we have a bike lane basically from all along Guthrie, uh, right to Lazo and to McDonald Road, but to the city of Courtney's jurisdiction. Uh, there was uh, identified uh, from the public um, that Lazo Road needed some improvements. I'll get into that project a little bit later. Um, and no consistency, uh, no consistent routes throughout the jurisdiction. So I have a couple of projects that'll highlight some improvements that we're making there, as well as separated um, path lanes as well. So um, I'll speak to some of the improvements that we're doing on that, which is my next slide. So some of the town capital projects, which we have four, and I just highlighted these specifically um, because they're all four of them have a significant regional benefit um, that I'll highlight. You've heard three of the four. All, well, actually, no, I think you heard of all four of them already because of the partnerships that we have with the regional district, uh, Ministry of Transportation, um, and D&D. &D and uh, and um, yeah, so the two roundabouts. So this is just an aerial uh, photo showing you the location. So again, the red line is the boundary for the town of Comox. So the first uh, roundabout is coming from the city of Courtney along Dyke Road through regional districts through Comox First Nation um, up to the Comox Hill. We have the Blue Glacier and Comox Avenue roundabout, um, which also connects into Back Road, which is in the regional district and then the city of Courtney. So some definitely regional benefits there. And the uh, second one is on Rodello, which is just east of the St. Joseph's, um, the old St. Joseph Hospital along Comox Avenue. This is the concept, uh, or this is not the concept, this is the actual design of the Comox Space Area Roundabout. And as Chris alluded to, this is one of the five um, capital improvement projects that we're gonna do in partnership with the regional district when we go through for the conveyance project. So the roundabout is uh, improving the level of service for all modes, for transportation, for transit, for cyclists, and for pedestrians. Um, so that would be a huge improvement at the top of the hill as you enter into the town of Comox. And very similar, uh, this is what the Comox Rodello roundabout would look like. Um, I forgot to mention, yeah, this one's at, at the capital uh, cost of 1.9 million and Comox Rodello is at $1.6 million project. This is a four-legged uh, roundabout, uh, which has transit coming off of Rodello as well. So some good improvements, the roundabouts are, are um, what the town is gonna consider uh, first and foremost on any type of intersection improvements, uh, just because of the number of benefits that you have in um, installing a roundabout. The next project is the Glasgow multi-use path, um, which Mark has a slightly less capital project. So that's good news for me. I had it at 2.2 million. So I'll talk to the regional district. Um, and we got the 1.3 million uh, federal grant that the regional district uh, submitted on, on behalf of the town of Comox as well. So a partnership there. The red um, is, is the town boundary, um, and the yellow line that I have is actually the limits of the entire um, project um, limits, where it starts on Balmoral at Butcher's Road, um, which I should have put different colors in for the town's portion of it, but um, from Balmoral to Forster, it's going to be the regional district, and then from Forster Road to Guthrie Road along Lazo will be within the town of Comox. And then um, just past Guthrie to Simba Road will be falls all within the regional district. 
highlighting the Simba Road because we'll tie in the next project that we have in there shortly. Um, so that's the overall um, project scope of that one. Uh, this is the cross section of that the same project and Mark kind of alluded to it already. So uh, the town had secured a 12 meter parkland dedication along Lazo between Forrester and Guthrie as part of development and when the applications came in. So that section of the multi-use path uh, will be a separate bike path lane. Uh, it'll be a three meter wide uh, meandering path as well uh, around the existing trees so we can preserve as much tree canopy as we can within that area. And then some of the cross section um, Mark also mentioned is, is a little bit different application that the regional district has to consider going through the Lazo Marsh area and the environmental sensitive sensitivities that they have to consider um, on that portion. This project is at 90% design. I believe we have a meeting next week with the Ministry of Transportation. Um, they have some concern on some of the bubbles that we have installed for the Guthrie um, intersection because we're looking at some traffic calming that we would like to put in there. Um, and they have some concerns with some of the road markings uh, for the bike lanes. Um, so we'll have that follow up discussion with them so we can hopefully move this project forward and get it out to construction this summer. The last project um, is the town's Lazo road widening project. It's at a cost of $3 million. We were successful in securing a $500,000 provincial grant for this project. Um, and it just ties into that multi-use path. Um, again, the yellow is the uh, project limits of this project. So it goes from Simba Road, basically from our tip to tip of our of the town of Comox boundary from Simba Road uh, right to the night uh, Night Road, uh, Kai Bay. So this project is uh, is the Lazo Road widening. We're going to take on the multi-use path where the regional uh, district and the town are working on the multi-use path. This project will carry that multi-use path from Simba to Sand Pines, uh, where we'll have a uh, crossing of the road on, on Lazo and get it connected onto the existing multi-use path that we have along the foreshore in Quay Homes. Um, so we can, can complete that um, multi-use path and uh, we'll carry on with um, bike lanes throughout the entire section of that highlighted yellow um, corridor and tie it into the existing um, bike lanes that the Ministry of Transportation just constructed um, along Knight Road. They constructed that last year and the section um, just uh, west of Simba, they constructed a couple of years ago. So. This project has been um, definitely a priority for the town of Comox and the Ministry of Transportation, and it's been in the works for a number of years. So um, this project is out to tender right now, uh, closes on the 26th of May. So if it falls within budget and everything's ready to go, it'll get constructed this summer. And then that will formalize and uh, have that connectivity for the bike lanes basically for the entire uh, very popular bike route from Guthrie Road all the way to Pritchard Road. Um, we'll have the dedicated um, bike lanes for that entire um, section. So, so that's great. I highlighted two intersections because um, we're also uh, going to implement some traffic calming uh, measures as well. So the, at Sand Pines, we have the crosswalk um, crossing there that's going to be elevated and that's where the multi-use path is going to cross Lazo Road and connect it onto the um, existing multi-use path along the foreshore and at South Wind Road we're going to have a raised intersection a complete raised intersection uh, at that inter at that location um, which is close to where the boat ramp is there's lots of activity going down there so really trying to th uh, slow down traffic um, for that area. This is just some cross sections again, um, showing basically what I explained, the three meter wide um, multi-use path that we'll have along the roadway um, from Simba to Sand Pines. That will be uh, asphalt um, that we can connect it and then we'll carry on with the 1.5 meter bike lanes um, throughout the entire project limits for that one. And that's my presentation. So we'll be happy to answer any questions. And if I don't know the answer, I'm in good hands because I have the mayor and a couple of councillors and the CAO here. <laughs> All right, thanks so much, Shelley. We do have a couple of questions for you, starting with Director Hardy. Yeah, thanks for the presentation, Shelley. Um, a question I do have for the town of Comox, uh, 
looking long term here is I during my door knocking back in September and October, I, I heard a lot of folks talk about uh, the need for Anderton Road to be enhanced with regards to multi-use paths, recognizing that Anderton Road is the major corridor or uh, artery or vein going from area B into uh, the town of Comox. I'm just wondering if there's been any thought long-term planning in regards to a multi-use path going from basically Comox Ave in Anderton right out to Waveland Road out towards Seal Bay Park and also towards the Little River Ferry Terminal. The section on Anderton Road um, that's within the town of Comox has existing bike lanes. Um, What's what's a difficult um, issue in regards to putting in the multi-use paths and having it separated from um, your vehicle traffic is road dedication. Um, that's the biggest challenge on existing um, development within the town. Or so we try to secure it when we can and envision it. I, at this point, we don't have the land to put any type of multi-use path along the section within the town, but we do have the infrastructure for sidewalks and bike bike lanes, dedicated bike lanes. Going north for that, I don't have anything or haven't talked to the regional district in regards to uh, something for the future, but certainly can discuss that with them. Um, I have heard and what we do have in the plans is kind of a more east-west connectivity in regards to hopefully constructing a uh, multi-use path um, and connecting Anderton Road to Pritchard Road through the Dryden uh, Road dedication. So that is a project that the town of Comox has that we can connect. It's more east-west, not heading north, um, but I think that will uh, provide a, a good um, uh, connectivity for a, uh, residents within the area B north of the Knight Road. I think there's quite a bit of residential um, families that live there that go to a number of schools within the town of Comox and Knight Road is very narrow. So getting them to cross uh, Knight Road and get them on the Hudson connection and enter the Dryden will provide a good connectivity for that area. Yeah, just a quick follow up. So if I'm understanding you correctly, it's really the town of Comox, their main interest is going east, west, and not so much south, north. Yeah, well, for future annexation, you mean? On annexation, I'm talking about the multi-use uh, bike path that would provide benefits to both Area B and the town of Comox. Yeah, I'll have to work with the regional district on what they're what they're thinking of putting in within the regional district area, um, but we don't have anything planned within the town of Comox limits at this point. I see town council, uh, town of Comox councillors with their eyes down. So <laughs> thanks. Okay, next we have Director Arbor. Thanks. I, I think it's really great to see uh, municipalities kind of put forward. You know, we ask about capital projects, and it's great to see active transportation projects be uh, brought forward today. And I have to say, like, between the master plan that the district has, has built and obviously each municipality have their own internal kind of um, network plans, if you will, for active transportation, I guess I still don't have a firm understanding as to whether we have a common map for all of it and whether we have discussed strategic priorities across all of it. Um, one thing that I would note on your presentation is um, I'm around there sometimes and, and um in, in regards to the Cape Lazo and all that, I see bi bikers uh, on weekends all the time. It's a very popular recreational route. But in terms of my questions about the more, the more on, during the weekdays where I see a lot of bikers coming out of Comox is along uh, the dike road and heading to Courtney. So my question, and I'm sorry, I'm not on the switch commission, but my question is um, as part of switch project, if we're gonna have 12 to 18 months disruption, and there's going to be single link. And is there some reassurance that for bikes, we'll be able to maintain both directions? Because I have a hard time people. Yeah, I see some nodding from the chair of the switch commission. And then I, I'm aware there was a project a few years ago around looking at improvements there, but we'll leave that for another day. I don't know it's got some complications around it for that connectivity between Comox and Courtney. Thanks. 
Yeah, um, Chris is here. I'm sure you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that is uh, the focus that we're, gonna, we're working with the regional district on and very important for the town of Comox as well, uh, that we maintain as much bike lanes as possible through the conveyance project so that we can provide people who are on their vehicle to have that shift and potentially bike to work or bike to school um, and ensure that we have access both ways throughout the conveyance project. Wonderful, thank you. Oh, Director Helian, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I, I just have to say that um, there are some people in the community who think that uh, all we do in Courtney is build bike lanes to the exclusion of anything else. Uh, and it's just very reassuring to hear how important they are to the, Comox, to the town of Comox, which I would point out has led the way in the construction of bike lanes in the Comox Valley. Thanks. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> All right. I don't see any further lights. Thank so you. thank you so much, Shelley. And that's it for our presentations. All right. And oh my gosh, we're actually on time. We went from being 45 minutes behind to on time. Should we move me seeing them all this? Uh no, I think we're good. Yeah, I'll just do a little little wrap up. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank everyone for their presentations today. It was really great information exchange. And the Comox Valley is an awesome place to live. And that is in part due to the work of all the people in this room and, and out there online. And we should uh, endeavor to collaborate even more. We're doing a great job on, on a lot of these projects, but I think there, there's uh, a lot we can do there's a lot of overlap in the work that we do and and I think that we could even amp up our cl collaboration even more so I hope that is uh, uh, what we could do in the future and we can hopefully have another session like this uh, in the next quarter all right <laughs> thanks everyone have a great day yeah, motion to, motion to terminate. <laughs> Cole Hamilton. Yeah. Harbor. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone.